Yes. Everybody. All right. I think we are here. We can get unmuted over there. Are we, are we we're... connecting crucially? Oh, I was muted. We have connected crucially. Yay. <laughs> Crucial connection. Hey, Naomi here. I'm going to be on mute and, and video silence. Thank you, Fantastic. Naomi. Good evening, everyone. So Hello, I'm, I'm Anthony Mosley. I am Clabber Action's Artistic Director. Yes, and I'm Mark. Yeah. Hey, I'm jumping all over each other. I'm going to just make a big space here for my sister. Come on, introduce yourself, Carl. Listen, I am Carla Stillwell, director, playwright, cultural historian for Black Joy, and the producer here at Collaboration. And I give it directly to my dear friend, Dr. Marcus. Uh, yes, I'm glad to be a kind of amongst your friends and, and to be a Together Network host and most delighted to be a member of the board of directors of Collaboration and have this opportunity to work with Anthony. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Anthony. Welcome to the 28th episode of Crucial Connections, our monthly gathering around this digital campfire to cultivate our connection and personal obligation to one another. And we have a very special show for you tonight. So join us uh, in this work by becoming a Collabor Activist member, uh, starting at just $1 a month. That's only $12 a year to support and sustain our work to incite social change. And, and you'll receive lots of great benefits. And if you're not already a member, just go to collaboraction.org to learn a little more. Join today. The link is in the chat. So um, that's what it's all about. Just, just become a member with us. And Collaboraction is really proud to be producing the trial in the Delta, the murder of Emmett Till which is an immersive play adapted by G. Riley Mills and Willie Round and directed by Anthony Mosley and Dana Anderson at the DeSable Museum on February 26th and 27th. That's just next week. Now, this transcript of this trial was hidden for over 50 years. And this performance is the first public exploration of this important piece of the civil rights movement. As a primer for this trial, uh, the trial in the Delta, we are going to uh, focus our conversations tonight on the injustices of the American legal system and how these disparities are, are showing up in our nation's past, how they present themselves today, and how honoring the journey to equity is one of the most important tools to righting the wrongs and, and eve ejecting, affecting the trajectory of change in the American legal system that has plagued generations of, 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 of BIPOC and Atlanta citizens. And we wanna make this change for years to come. So we have a very special panel of guests tonight. Oh my goodness, our guests will help us frame this conversation in a way that will open up uh, the doors to a rich discussion. And I know this discussion will move us forward in our thinking and will help us lean into what we can all do together to create change and foster healing. So uh, right now, tonight, our guests are Marion Brooks, my goodness, so glad to have her on board. She's an investigative news reporter, Marion Brooks. She's an award-winning anchor and reporter for NBC5. She anchors the NBC5 News at 11 a.m. and 4.30 each weekday and is a member of the NBC5's investigative team of investigative reporters and is currently the host of the documentary series, The Lost Story of Emmett Till. We also have uh, Ms. Marilyn Height Ross, Esquire. Uh, Ms. Ross served as the 18th state's attorney for Winnebago County uh, in uh, Illinois, and she's the first African-American, first woman to hold this position. Now, she served in this position for more than 25 years. She was appointed as, uh, as an assistant state's attorney to special prosecutor 
Kane County's uh, State's Attorney Office, Attorney Joseph McMahon, Joseph McMahon, in the prosecution of Chicago Police Officer Jason Van Dyke. There's a name you won't forget uh, for the murder uh, of the 16-year-old Laquan McDonald. And tonight we also have. Naomi Davis, Naomi Davis, founder of Blacks in Green. And if you haven't, you know, if you haven't driven down on the South Side and just uh, had a chance to step into her, her gallery and, and see about her organization, you have missed something. So uh, Blacks in Green, BIG is a nonprofit organization that serves as a bridge and catalyst among communities and, and their stakeholders in the design and the development of green self-sustaining, mixed income, walkable villages and communities owned and populated by African-Americans. Blacks and Green um, has acquired the Till family home and is developing that property into the Emmett Till House Museum. So Anthony, please bring them all out. Come on, let them get into the room with us. Let's get started. I think actually first we're gonna start with uh, Marion Brooks. Uh, NBC Chicago investigative reporter and a real aficionado of the Till story. Good evening, Marion. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Anthony, for having me. This is very exciting and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, you know, the, uh, this story has is, is really been a large part of your, your life's work. Um, if you would uh, tell us a little bit about how this has become a, a, a big part of your, your career and your body of work and, and what, what this story means to you. Well, I counted among uh, probably the most important story that I've worked on in my career thus far. And, I, and I've been honored to do, I believe, a lot of really important work. So um, it's right up at the top of, of the list of the work that I've done. The Emmett Till story is... Um, it is timeless, sadly, in the United States of America. We are still seeing parallels to the Emmett Till story today. Um, and so one of the things that I think is so critical about being a journalist, being a storyteller, and, uh, and, and I know you all feel the same way at Collaboration as part of just your mission of being, is to inform and educate and be a truth teller. And the Emmett Till story, sadly, almost fell out of the public consciousness entirely. It did fall out of the public consciousness for 30 years. It was almost lost to us. Um, and one of our, our former journalists at NBC5, Rich Samuels, back in 1985, is credited by the Till family with bringing Emmett Till's name back into the public consciousness. Not that Mamie Till hadn't continued to talk about him for years and from the moment he was, uh, was lynched, but the public was not uh, kept aware. And so that was sort of the genesis when I rediscovered, there was a lot of rediscovery that happened with this story. I rediscovered Rich Samuel's work and went on from there to try to bring it to today's audience as well. Yeah, you've kind of taken the torch and are, are, are keeping the campfire lit around this very important story. Your, your, um, your documentary, um, The Lost Story of Emmett Till, The Universal Child, uh, recently premiered. It was just so powerful and just packed with important history on a personal level. I just want to thank you for putting the work in and inspiring uh, the folks over here at Collaboration to keep up with you. Um, we'll put that link in the chat um, because people really need to watch your, your documentary, it's, it's really sharp. And you touch on so much in a short amount of time. Um, tell everybody a little bit about, about that. You probably hear my daughter right here next to me. This is, uh, you know, <laughs> what we do these days in the Zoom world. That's right. So, uh, anyway. Um, Bring so, her on. Bring her on. Uh, she's very shy. She will not. I, I would try, but she will not. She's now left the room. Okay. Well, one of the things that we did was we we really wanted to tell the context of Emma Till and, and sort of fill in the story because I think there's, it's, the, it, the devil is always in the details and the context is so critical. So some key things that we were able to showcase in the, in the story. One is that one of the things that pops right away into my mind is, is that 
one for 30 years, the story was lost. We explain how that could possibly happen. The other thing we talk about that I wanted to point out right away was how young Emmett Till is. You know, you hear 14 year old, but he had just turned 14. He was, he's a, he was a boy, he was a young boy. And I wanted to really pound that home. Another thing, the scope of what happened to him happened in a period of six months from the time that he left Chicago till the time that the Look Magazine article came out where the killers confessed to killing him. It all happened in a period of six months. And after that, his name started to fall away from public consciousness. Can you imagine George Floyd's story? After six months, nobody talking about George Floyd, but everything from his kidnapping to the, to the trial, to the acquittal, to his mother going on tour talking about him, to the confession in 19, January 56, six month period of time, and then started to fall away. So I just thought it was so critical to just bring some of these key contextual moments. And another big thing was that when Emmett, Emmett wasn't supposed to go to Mississippi. His, he, he knew his cousin was going, he wanted to go, he begged to go. His family in Chicago didn't want him to go. They were worried that this, the very thing that would happen to him would happen. And they tried to prepare him for it. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people know that his family didn't just send him down like a lot of folks do today when they got family in Mississippi. They were very, very hesitant about it. So that was a critical component. And he went down to Mississippi that was in the middle of a, it, it was, it was the tension, the racial tension was boiling at that point. You, a year before it had the Brown versus Board of Education decision, Lamar Smith, who had been an activist trying to register African-Americans to vote, was shot on the steps of the Brookhaven courthouse the day that, that Emmett Till was begging to go down. Um, the field secretary for the NAACP in Belzona, Mississippi, was shot about three weeks before Emmett Till uh, was begging to go down. So all of this was happening right as Emmett Till was begging to go see family. So it was a hot, hot bed of tension when he went down there. So these are all things that I think people need to understand, to understand the context of what the world was like as Emmett Till was, was making his way to Mississippi. Well, and you do that uh, such a good job of that in the documentary where you really zoom into the timeline and you really give us the context for what um, this barely 14-year-old Chicago boy was, was coming into. Um, we had our first in-person rehearsal last night for Trial in the Delta. It was, it was most of our first real in-person rehearsal in over two years. Um, the cast and the crew... Um, we, we, we know that we are, um, working on something special, bigger than all of us. And we're really serving, um, this part of the story. And, and, uh, we, we, uh, adapted the 354 page trial, uh, transcript that was hidden for a long time. Most people don't know that you're kind of the, the, the godmother of this project, you were the one that um, brought the transcript to us. I did. Um, tell everybody a little bit about, about um, how you got your hands on the transcript and, um, and, and how you hooked up with us. So I think this is a great story as it relates to, to you guys, and it's a real testament to your creative prowess. So I got the transcript. I Googled it. I read an article and some of the research I was doing that the transcript was discovered after 50 years. The FBI managed to find the transcript, and, uh, and it was, it's out there. You could Google it, and you could get it for yourself right now. So I, you know, I printed it up. I read through it. I was like, this is, I want to be able to use this. How can I, with not just, you know, putting the words on the screen, I wanted to be able to hear it. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we could find some actors to just do a table read and put it together and then we could use clips of it for our documentary. So I talked to Leanne Trotter, our, our arts produce, producer and reporter. And I said, do you have any, what, what would be a good theater group do you think that we could approach? And she thought immediately of you guys I called you, Anthony, and I said, hey, I've got this transcript. What do you think about maybe doing a table read for us? You guys took the ball and ran. Next thing I know, you've adapted it into a, to a stage play. And, uh, and I, can't, I can't wait to see what you've done. And you did, you did a fantastic job. It hues 
very strictly, you know, obviously you had to pare it down. There was a lot, you know, if you, anybody has watched a real trial in person there and, and um, the state's attorney uh, height can talk a little bit about this. There's a lot that goes in that's that, that you don't need to have in the dramatic, in a dramatic setting. And for our purposes, we wanted some highlights for our documentary as well. Um, so that's kind of how it came to be. And we hope to be using parts of your work in a part two that we are planning for the Emmett Till documentary series that we are doing. And I'm so thankful that you guys did take it on the way you did because the, because the trial is a part that people only really heard the verdict of. They only heard all white jury, non, not guilty. The, the jury took, a, took an hour to come to a decision. And, and that's really all that people know. But yeah. what you're going to showcase is really, you know, the real drama, as most court cases have, the real drama that, that, that came through this. And, the, you know, the, it just sort of pounds home the injustice of what happened to Emmett Till. And, and just the courage and the heroic display of commitment to truth and honesty that not, not only Mamie showed, but Mose Wright, Willie Reed, and Chester Miller, they all uh, put their lives on the line that day. And, um, you know, as we've been working on the play, you know, a multiverse theme is very popular these days, you know? And I can't help think, what would the world be like today if Mamie hadn't done what she did back then? Um, and so when we got our hands on it, you know, it just felt like, how has this not been done before? How is it's this- amazing, it amazing, isn't it? Because it was found, the transcript was found in 2005. So this is the first, so it's, it's not like it was just yesterday. So this is the first time that people will get a chance to see. And I'll tell you, Mamie's decision to, she, the, the three critical decisions that we point out that actually Christopher Benson, her co-author pointed out to me, deciding to bring the body back from Mississippi. They wanted to bury it right then and there. Deciding to showcase his body by leaving an open casket and allowing so many people to see it and allowing him to be photographed. That image, there's no question that that changed the trajectory of the civil rights movement and was a major catalyst. Rosa Parks talks about how she was inspired. So you're right, that is a great question. What would have happened if she had not taken those brave stances that she did? You know, one of our actors who's playing Moe's right, um, uh, Darren Jones is fabulous. And he said, you know, I knew about Mamie Till and Emmett Till before I knew about Dr. King. Uh -huh. And my whole life, I've kind of, you know, I've kind of thought of Emmett Till. And now here I am a part of this story. And so, um, and, you know, we're staging it immersively. So if you come to DuSable, um, you will be in the courtroom. You will be in the midst of it, you know, and you will be hearing words that hadn't, have not been, um, theatrically exhumed um, since, since that um, joke of a trial. Um, and um, we're just so grateful that you, you um, have brought the, the, the script, the transcript to us. And I uh, got to give a shout out to G. Riley Mills and Willie Round, um, our, our writer duo uh, spectacular that just went, <laughs> I mean, they went fast. They went they went hard. They were inspired. And the whole team has really been inspired by this opportunity. So um, I put I put the um, link in the, the chat to the part one of the documentary. And uh, we we uh, while we're, um, you know, um, bringing this to life over the next 10 days here, uh, we'll we'll be um, thinking about Emmett and Mamie and all those heroes in that in that courtroom down in Tallahatchie County. Yeah. Mary, thank you so much for joining. We have a couple of great guests and then we're going to all kind of chat at the end here. So please stick around if you can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for what you guys are doing and for, for putting it on stage so that more people can see this and, and see just what, what, what happened back then and what kind of keep us in mind about what continues to happen today. Thank you. Carla. Hey, Anthony. Thank you so much, um, Marion. Um, I'd like to introduce you all and bring up um, to the Zoom room, Marilyn Height Ross, Ross Esquire, 
Um, I can't see Marilyn. Where is she? There she is. <laughs> Sorry about that. I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> I, I, listen, this is this is that Zoom life. We're yes, all living that Zoom life. Thank yes, you is. so much for joining us. Um, Marion gave us some really rich context about Emmett Till and the trial of Milam and Bryant, the men that murdered him. Um, and how, and, and we all know historically that that is the, and that is one of the inciting events that started the modern civil rights movement. Um, but I really wanted to talk to you and so glad you could be here today because uh, Robert Frost has a poem that starts, nature's first green is gold. So everything that's old is new, it's all kind of the same. And with the work that you did on the Van Dyke trial, I would, I would love to hear some of your reflections and thoughts about the echoes from those past injustices and those past trials and how you all and how your office fought through that and got the conviction for that gentleman. Thank you, Carla. First, I'd just like to correct that I wasn't state's attorney for 25 years. I was state's attorney between 2018 and 2020 and decided okay. not to seek election, but I have been a veteran prosecutor for more than 25 years. Okay. And in the context of the Van Dyke trial, I was an assistant working uh, in Winnebago County, and because there was a conflict with the Cook County State's Attorney at the time, Ms. Fox. The procedure is for the Chief Judge to solicit another elected official throughout the state to prosecute the case. I can tell you that there were several elected officials that refused to prosecute Jason Van Dyke. My boss at the time, State's Attorney Joe Bruscato and State's Attorney Joseph McMahon of Kane County decided to collaborate and join and take on the prosecution. And that's how I became a member of the team led by state's attorney, Joe McMahon. And I give him accolades for having the courage to accept the case when so many others would not accept the prosecution. We believed that if we as public prosecutors refuse to prosecute a police officer when he committed a crime that we had no place in prosecuting anyone. And that was the mindset and philosophy that we had as we garnered to seek a conviction with Jason Van Dyke and to get justice for this child. So was the argument from the prosecutors from the attorney's offices that did not want to prosecute Van Dyke, what were they saying behind the scenes about behind, the reasons? Behind the scenes, we were hearing that it was because he was a police officer. And period. They, they, period. And they would not prosecute a police officer. Uh, my philosophy, along with Joseph McMahon and the other members of the trial team, was that the minute he stepped out of line, he ceased being a police officer and became a murderer. And our philosophy was to prosecute him like we would any other person that was charged with murder. And as you see, we actually went back in and, and re-indicted him and added additional charges after we were appointed to prosecute the case. Were you shocked that um, the jury found him guilty? Well, let me explain the procedure. So in Illinois, mm -hmm. in order for a jury to find a person guilty of second degree murder, the state has to first prove first degree murder. We prove first degree murder. Then the jury, if the defendant requests a lesser included instruction, has the right to determine whether or not the defendant has presented an affirmative defense. In this case, his affirmative defense was self-defense or mitigating factors that would reduce the charge of first degree murder to second degree murder. Our position was that it was a first degree murder case. 
there was no second degree murder involved, that it was intentional, it was an execution. Uh, this child's body was riddled with 16 gunshots and I mean, almost every organ it was, was hit. And I can tell you having prosecuted so many murder cases, these pictures were very hard for me to watch as a veteran prosecutor. And um, so the jury was given those instructions. The jury determined that Jason Van Dyke was entitled to be convicted of the lesser offense of second degree murder. Let me ask, um, let me fact check something. I heard um, at the time that Jason Van Dyke was the first police officer in the country to be indicted in that way and um, to be found guilty. Is that is that actually correct? That is what we were told. And in fact, in the city of Chicago, we were told that it had been almost 50 years before a Chicago police officer had ever been charged with first degree murder. And more importantly, after we received the conviction, a po Chicago police officer had not been previously convicted. And I can tell you that behind the scenes, this was not just a regular murder case. There were so many facets involved that we had to contend with during the trial, before the trial, and somewhat after the trial as well through the sentencing phase of Jason Van Dyke. What did you, what do you mean? Um, what, what facets? Okay, um, so let me, let me what just were the barriers? with you that uh, there was concern for the safety of the prosecution team. That was very real. We had security throughout the trial. We had security provided to all of us at the hotel. We had security provided to us to and from the courthouse. And I can tell you that when we discussed security, it was at that time that my husband had to take a step back. And I, as a veteran prosecutor, never felt that I would feel unsafe doing my job. And that was a real concern for the prosecution team during this trial. One last question before we um, move forward with the, the, the evening. What do you think changed in that courtroom that made, that, that, that persuaded the jury in what I think is the right direction? What, 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 what cultural shift do you think happened? I think what happened was number one, we were public prosecutors. We were not someone who was not a prosecutor, but a private lawyer that was specially appointed. So we took the helm. I think secondly, we presented this case like we would any other murder case. We expected a conviction. I know most people did not. We did because as murder cases go, you rarely have them captured on video. And we had it captured on video. And so I think the fact that we garnered, you know, the uh, resources, the experience, all of us were very experienced uh, in prosecuting. I myself have reviewed several officer related shootings and I was clear that this, is, that this was first degree murder. And we put those resources together and we worked as a team. And I, I just can't thank Joe McMahon enough for inviting me to be part of that team and for him taking the lead in that prosecution and standing up when other colleagues would not take the lead for this prosecution to get justice for this child. Thank you, Marilyn. If you could stick around for our group discussion just a little bit, sure. because I want to take this opportunity to also introduce and bring up um, my, my, my new friend, Naomi Davis, who is the executive director of Blacks in Green and um, the founder. And I wanted to make sure that we also talked about um, the community partnerships and put that piece on the table before we move forward. Um, because what you do 
is also a rich part of the history of the Till story, which I think is a Chicago story and which, um, and the injustice that happened in Mississippi rippled throughout the nation and especially the South side where we are. So I wanted to give you an opportunity, Naomi, thank you for being here to, um, to, to say a few words about the work that you're doing. Well, it's my great joy and my honor to be here and our, our guest tonight, I just, I'm so moved. I, I really want to give a special thanks. Um, I, I was not familiar with the story of the travel, of the transcript. I was not uh, aware of the great muscle behind the prosecution uh, that was just described. And so I, I just stand in awe and appreciation of those others who are in the story, who are standing um, in, in the crucible. And, and thank you, Collabor Action, for uh, your work in focusing uh, the attention where it, it needs to be for our humanity. So uh, Blacks and Green, I mean, we, we are the authors of the eight principles of green village building. And the fifth principle is each village celebrates its stories um, in print, digital, and theatrical forms. And so when I met Collabor Action and we began talking about that intersection where our work in our physical community of West Woodlawn. Um, and as you all have learned, I'm a child of the theater. I grew up understanding the power of theater to change hearts and minds like no other medium can. And, um, and my own personal journey as, as, a, as, a, as a great migration child and uh, the idea that the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley house, garden, and um, theater, that we uh, discovered the asset when I moved here to the neighborhood of West Woodlawn and found it just like so many other households, shuttered, disgraced, blighted, squatted, I mean, we actually didn't understand until we closed on the building in October, on October 6, 2020, that squatters had been living in the house for some untold period of time. Mm -hmm. that, that the school boys and girls would be walking up and down the streets past this, this historic treasure without the slightest glimmer or understanding of the seeds of genius and courage and love and the idea that the great migration had been um, vested here in West Woodlawn and was symbolized by the Till family story, that we had that, that it was not treasured in an active way. And, um, and of course, then it becomes deeply personal because I was born the day before Emmett was slain. My great migration family, I, I often say I'm Naomi Davis and I come from white gloves and mud, the proud mm -hmm. granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers who like millions too. of others, voted with their feet and moved up south for freedom and economic opportunity. And mm -hmm. my aunts and uncles and my mom were among those millions. And I was raised, born and raised in New York City, um, but all my life taught to love my people, taught the migration story and taught to recognize that if there were one word after all of the conversations, after all of the family stories, 
after all of the, you know, it's just sort of push for recognition and then later reparations, that one word would be triumph. Triumph. We are an indestructible people. We have survived and sur thrived in spite of all the odds. And the Emmett and Mamie Till Mowry story, I mean, on the one hand, it's like, okay, I was one of those kids who was sent south for the summer. Mm -hmm. My dad was in Arkansas, we went there. Um, my, my mom um, migrated, the first migration was from Mentor City, Mississippi to Memphis, I went there. Um, so the idea that we are the living legacy of the comers and how they made American cities great because of their work ethic and their hunger and their belief and their um, traditions and their lifestyle. So I, I'm living in West Woodlawn as a grateful descendant of those who believed for the yet unborn that there was something to be believed in. And we don't take that mantle lightly. So we're here as Blacks and Green with the Emmett and Mamie Till Mobley House Museum, Garden and Theater. Why garden? Why theater? Because, you know, that horticultural legacy that we inherited was like, okay, uh, a lot of people back when Big was born in 2007 used to say, well, you know, oh my God, why don't Black people care more about the environment? Excuse me, excuse me, except we're the original environmentalists except that the conservation lifestyle that many of us were groomed in as we uh, learned the ways, the old ways, excuse me, far outpaced the, the uh, shrine of technology that many people think is gonna save us and it won't because it's all in what we call the business model. How do we track the money that comes in and the money that goes out, who benefits from this quote unquote new green economy? Blacks and Green is deeply in the spirit of our legacy. We are deeply educated in the technologies that are changing everything. But we are more than anything else looking at how we recreate that walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play, village, where Emmett grew up and where, where those of us who went south for the summers and who survived um, can live to bring the story to the next generation with partners like Collaboration, where we can say, I mean, Kudos to Marion Brooks that she tracked and elevated that, that transcript and kudos to the playwrights. Because let me tell you something, I picked up that script more than a few times and had to put it back down. I saw, mm -hmm. I saw women of the movement all you know, six series, three episodes, three weeks. And, and I knew the story and it was wincing and painful and the trauma of going through the appreciation. We wanted to see it and we could not, we could not reckon, we, we had to recognize the pain that we still felt today. And when I picked up Trial in the Delta, and when I began to look at how to, 
I, I mean, I really, frankly, couldn't read it in one, in one, in one piece. It's hard to digest. It's hard, it's, it's, to, it's digest. hard to digest because it seems so obvious that these people should be in jail. It seems, and it's hard to digest that the legal system is so cavalier with black bodies. And when they, and when the Department of Justice recently closed the case mm -hmm. and said, oh, well, and in the absence, I mean, in the presence of the confessions mm -hmm. um, published for pay and in the um, absence of the, we'll, we'll call it a confession of Carolyn Bryant, mm -hmm. um, that we are still not vested in justice on that murder and that we, we nevertheless must find our way to healing. So justice, healing, Mamie was uh, recognized around the world for that forgiveness, but like, you know, some of us understand resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. I mean, right. we serve ourselves when we forgive. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it's so hard. And so here we are in the middle of West Woodlawn at the Emmett and Mamie Till Mobley House Museum, Garden and Theater. Uh, just really so grateful that we've met Collaboration, Action, that we have a chance to uh, lift up and support uh, Marion Brooks in her documentary and that we have a chance to let the next generation understand that um, there is a triumph of African diaspora people in this country that they can and must be proud of. And because we believe in theater the way that we do, looking at intergenerational, the elders, the babies, what's the soundtrack of this movement? What are we gonna right. create? What are we gonna do? Now see Naomi, you, you just opened the door for the next part of this discussion because the conversation is always around collaboration about the future. So I wanna bring the whole panel up um, so that we can have a discussion and Dr. Marcus can move us into the light and talk to our panelists and get their ideas about next steps. But I, I want to go back to where we began with, with Marion and ask her, as the representative of the fourth estate, um, the the group of in our nation and our culture that that holds the the distinction and position in the com in the community to speak truth to power, even when it pisses power off, and to tell the truth about our experience with one another, even when it shames us and hurts us. I wonder how uh, this discovery of this new uh, of this trial document and your perusing it for the first time. How did that impact you, and what and what did that do for you in terms of um, really, you know, uh, fortifying your stance as a journalist whose job it is to see. Well, I was, I knew obviously about the trial. I'd done a lot of research on it. Very proud of the black press and the work that they'd done in keeping the story, bringing the story to the world in 1955. Seeing the trial, you know, and Naomi can probably speak to this and anybody who reads, and, and I'm sure attorney Height Ross too, anytime you read a transcript, at least when I do, I feel like I'm in the, in the, mo in the audience. You feel like you're there. And as painful as it is, uh, and it is painful to, to hear some of the, the comments and um, it, 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 it's still important. And it just makes me want to work harder to get the information out there. It's why I wanted it to be read as opposed to just putting the words on the screen, which I could have done. I wanted, to, I wanted people to be able to hear uh, 
what, even though they were not alive anymore, hear the words that were spoken not just see the words, hear the words. There's power in hearing, you know, all the senses need to be touched. So I was moved, I was moved. I was moved to, to try to find a way to get somebody to be able to bring it to the, to the public um, so that they could hear it yeah. and see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hearing it spoken on the, on the voice, on the breath of a human being so that these words come to life. And uh, so with that comment, uh, Mary, and I wanna uh, pivot to, to Attorney Ross and say, you know, as, as you um, take on uh, right. a case like this, uh, and like the ones that you've had to take on um, um, here with Laquan La McDonald, uh, what, what, what impact does it have for you as a, a woman of color uh, well, to know that, that you now have a uh, 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 have the opportunity to say words in a space, uh, the saying of which could mean the difference between justice and the miscarriage of justice. How does that land on you and how did you prepare yourself? Well, I think as an African-American woman, uh, it's imperative that the state's attorney's office reflect the community that they serve. And so being an African-American prosecutor, you bring to the table cultural differences that may be perceived as a negative by your white counterpart. And if you are not there, then you cannot inform them that, for example, a child, an African-American teenager who comes into court with his pants below his butt, doesn't mean he's in a gang. He's trying to fit in with his group of friends. So just because he doesn't wear a suit and tie or just because he may live in public housing does not mean that this child does not have a future. And I have belonged to the National Black Prosecutors Association for over 20 years. And their goal is to recruit and retain African-American and prosecutors of color so that we can be in these offices to be an instrument of change and meeting out justice in the community. Prosecutors should meet out justice without biases. And if you don't recognize that you have a bias, you can't progress towards the solution of not having that play in to your decision to charge or not charge or to send someone to prison or to put them in the diversion program. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for always being present, representing and bringing that. And it's good to see some black women being considered for some of those highest level positions out there. And um, it's folks like you that will make a difference in our legal system, no doubt. I wanna turn my attention to uh, Ms. Davis and, and, uh, uh, and the Green Project, because you know I had the privilege of, uh, of just kind of just yeah. flowing through there. You were right, there. You were right, here. Yeah, right, right at right. We was right at the beginning of the pandemic. They were saying, "I don't know if we should be out," but we said, "You know what? We're going to come here and gather up and talk about what we need to talk about here to you know to celebrate each other, our community, our neighborhood, and our sense of belonging." And and I'm interested, uh, Naomi, uh, in your acquisition now of the Tillman House. Uh, the Till House and the future of what that could mean for our neighborhoods and community in terms of, you know, you know, the kind of things you pointed out earlier. It's like Emmett came from a neighborhood where we looked after each other, where, where Green was, that was the only way forward because we didn't have all that extra <laughs> stuff. So say some words to us about what, what it means to have the house and where it's going. Yeah. Well, you know, we have a long game uh, as, uh, as Black folks who have essentially one-tenth of the household wealth of our crosstown neighbors. And uh, we are contributing um, the least to global warming, but suffering the impacts first and foremost. And so we have um, a very vulnerable position that we find ourselves in, but at the same time, lots of evidence of our triumph to be celebrated. And so the Till House, when uh, we uh, received 
a great gift and were able to buy it for cash on October 6th of 2020. Um, it was uh, just the fulfillment uh, uh, at a soul level, um, but also in a material way that we have a story that lifts us up in no uncertain terms. There is no one who is more majestic than Mamie Till Mobley. There is no one who has been done more wrong than Emmett Till. There is no place in anywhere that symbolizes the, um, the fortitude of the comers, the settlers, those moving up south for freedom and economic opportunity than a place like West Woodlawn. And so the idea that we could, uh, in our very bruised, battered and vulnerable position right now, that we could have a place to, um, you know, it's, it, you know as, as storytellers, Collabor Action understands that, uh, you know, you have a cast of characters, you have an arc, um, you have a message, and that is what Till House is. We're looking at how do we um, let a, how do we engage a blighted community? And we're like, you know, every black community across the country where we used to walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play, where we were self-sustaining uh, against all the odds. And so we have been um, uh, at the verge of extinction, like so many hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods like us across the country. And so what can we say, who can we be about our, uh, about our triumph that allows us to um, really seed, cultivate and thrive um, as, that, as, as that narrative? So, so we're creating 6427 South St. Lawrence Avenue as a house museum. And we were blessed uh, by the uh, largesse of Iman Ali, who played the stand-in role of Mamie Chill in the Women of the Movement series. She was uh, blessed and kind enough and caring and perspicuous enough to say, okay, we have a movie set with the interior of the Till home. Can we, you know, we can just, you know, put it in a warehouse somewhere and just wrap it up and let it gather dust. They, uh, they uh, were able to bring that household uh, furnishing set to Chicago. We, we, we drove, we flew down and drove it back. We have it uh, ready as we um, restore. We got a $250,000 adopt a landmark uh, grant from the city of Chicago to begin uh, uh, restoring the exterior but we will be uh, creating a museum that on the second floor where uh, Miss Mamie and her boy Emmett lived will be, uh, will be cultivated as, a, uh, as, a, as a, a time sensitive space. So we're gonna recreate that home and we will have um, exhibitions. We will have a great migration repository, uh, uh, library. We, we invite people to um, you know, get in touch at our blacksandgreen.org, www.blacksandgreen.org uh, website. Come on to the website and say uh, what your uh, thoughts and ideas are for the kinds of programs that we should create. We've had an Emmett Till 80th birthday ice cream social. We've had an October 31st family fun day Sunday where we were out at the campus. We bought the two lots next door to the Emmett Till house. And so we're cultivating that as a garden space. We have Richard Hunt, an internationally renowned no sculptor really is. <laughs> who was also raised in uh, West Woodlawn to do a commission on the front lawn. And so the museum, the front lawn, and the, and, the, and the community performance space or how we're going to bring it uh, into the future connecting to our, uh, our most majestic roots. Amazing, amazing. So, wow. so say, Naomi, I'm gonna ask 
you to save a space for collaboration to come and do a project inside of your space. I'm definitely going to bring the band out to, to like jam in the space. But I'm wondering now, you know, um, the, the real person who knows how to ask a question around here is sitting over there with a first name M, that's not me, last name B, <laughs> Ms. Brooks. I wonder if, you know, given your visibility now on this trial and recognizing, you know, the work that uh, Attorney Ross does and the, the work that's being invested in, uh, in the community like Ms. Davis is doing, what questions might you have for them to round out your understanding of what you're doing with the Emmett Till project? Well, I do want to, a couple things. One, um, Naomi, I've been to, I went to the house and I talked to you on the phone, I think the day that I went there because the neighbor came out and was like, the news is down here taking a picture of the house. And so they, she called you on the phone and I was like, I'm just taking pictures. We're doing a documentary. So it was good, it's good to see your, your face, but you've done a wonderful job. We saw the garden down the street as well. That kind of, I'm a big believer in beauty also being important in communities. So um, my, a, a question if I, for, for Naomi would be, um, I mean, anybody could have just walked by it. How did you happen to find that house and in the work that you've done, how did you know about it? How did you stumble across the house and know that that's where they lived? Well, I, I found that out very early. I moved into the neighborhood in 2010. I had lost all my real estate and was looking for a cheap place to live and landed there. And after I got over my little nervous breakdown and got out and walked around and looked at the brilliant tree canopy and the beautiful architecture, and I began to dig down into what? gee, God, this is a magical, it felt magical to me. So I began asking questions of the neighbors and, I, and, and that's when I discovered, well, this is the great migration stronghold. There's a book written about West Woodlawn, Tight Little Island. And I bought the book, I read the book and it was like, oh my God, Lorraine Hansberry, Raisin in the Sun, my very most favorite play. And then down the street, Emmett Till with my own personal collection, connection, so it was through just being with the neighbors, digging down into uh, understanding the lemonade that could leave me in a place where I really personally felt broken and isolated. And to, and to, and, and to discover the beauty of the place was, was part of how I was determined to make myself whole. That is very cool. I always like to know the origin story of how people, you know, made those connections. And for attorney um, uh, Height Ross, I, my question for you is a couple of things. The first thing, what is, how did you feel about the judge sentencing the way he did, not on the 16 counts of aggravated assault where there would be a more, a, a longer sentence, but focusing on the second degree murder charge. And then not only that, choosing not such a long sentence, even within that charge. How did you feel about the judge's sentencing? On well, the, uh, we, on as the, the, we, the trial team, believe that the most serious charge was the aggravated battery with the firearm. And Illinois law says that the court must sentence on the most serious charge. So we actually filed a mandamus to have the higher court direct the trial court to sentence on um, what we believe were the most serious charges and that was rejected and so the judge was allowed to sentence on the second degree murder how do you feel about that though especially since he's now out of prison and it's been three years well obviously we believe that he deserved a longer sentence he deserved a sentence equivalent to a first degree murder a sentence because of the brutality of the death of this child. And that's what we argued for as we would with any other case, but obviously that didn't occur. And the prosecution team, I can tell you, we worked two and a half years, weekends, 12, 14 hours. We met with the community to let, to introduce ourselves prior to the prosecution. We answered their questions. We explained the process and we were ready. We put a lot of work and effort into it 
and Jason Van Dyke is now free and Laquan is buried and dead and doesn't get to live his life as this, you know, he was 17 for less than 30 days. So I still call him a 16 year old child because he had just turned 17. But as a prosecutor and an African-American prosecutor, I understand why there is hesitancy in the African-American community to cooperate with police and to trust the system. And that is why it's imperative that you have prosecutors like myself of color who understand the origins of this distrust in the criminal justice system. And it goes back to the Emmett Till situation and prior to that. It goes back to being counted as three-fifths of a person when the country was founded. So we have to continue to look at the context in which the criminal justice system is viewed. And that is why I have worked in it for so long, because I believe it's important for people like me to see people like me in the courtroom and not as a defendant. Well, you man. Your work was uh, obviously critical. It could not have been a more important prosecution. Um, I think I'm, I'm speaking, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I, I have to maintain objectivity uh, in my public discourse. Yes. I have my personal feelings, um, but in my public discourse, I have to maintain uh, objectivity. But there's no question that you all did a yeoman's job in the work that you did to um, to bring about a conviction. And I know there's been a lot of shock. There was a lot of shock following um, the sentencing and some of the subsequent rulings. Um, and it, it, I think it does speak to sort of where we are, you know, where we still are as a country. I think there's a there's somewhat of a parallel when you see a lot of these circumstances they, you could look back at Emma Till and you can look to today and you still see clear injustices. And I think what I'd like to share with your audience is that change only occurs when you get involved and become a participant to progress towards change. And so I applaud uh, your efforts and the documentary that you are doing. I applaud Ms. Davis and keeping alive those memories because if you don't know where you came from, you're going to repeat those errors. And they are constantly being repeated over and over again in the criminal justice system. And it's not a perfect system because nothing is perfect when the human factor is involved, but it is the system that we have. And if we want to change it, we have to be part of the change and we have to get engaged in the system to change it. Amen. Thank you. Marilyn, I'll, I'll never, I think probably all of us won't, will never forget where we were when the Van Dyke verdict was, was reached. And, um, um, you know, I, I, we are inspired by you and your work. And as we're working on this, this staging of the transcript of the trial of Malam and Bryant, um, I'm just so curious um, any insights you have about the unique nature of that trial? And do you have any advice for myself and Dana Anderson, my co-director, as we work with a with an actor, Andy Luther, who's trying to um, learn his lines and represent the prosecution um, in, in our stage play? Well, I think a lot of the, um, and I did see the, the, short clips about the women in the movement. And what I would say is that a lot of the things that occurred during that trial, many uh, of the states and the US Supreme Court have now uh, handed down case law that, that it would never happen to have an all white jury uh, for an African American without certain due process challenges being made during that trial. And I can tell you, even in the Van Dyke jury selection, the state can make a challenge because we believe during jury selection that certain African-Americans were excluded by the defense. And we were challenging that as well. And so those are things that have changed during the selection process with the Emmett Till trial also. 
a change of venue because there was obviously a conflict with the local law enforcement agency and the witnesses. And so the trial should never have been held in that area. With respect to the Justice Department reopening the case, they are able to do that because of the dual sovereignty between the states and the federal system. And that is why you are now hearing echoes of the Justice Department prosecuting Officer Van Dyke because they are not foreclosed from doing that because of the state prosecution. Excellent. Nice. <clears throat> well, I think we have bumped up against our time. Yes, Thank you all so much. Um, I am going to, well, we'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you. I can't wait yeah. to see you guys in person in a room where we can like, right, we can't hug yet, can we? <laughs> we can elbow bump now. The masks are coming off, so maybe. <laughs> maybe. Thank you so much, panelists, and we will be seeing you soon. Thank you. And then yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Marcus and Anthony. You know, so all I can say is that, uh, you know, Anthony, we did it again, man. Look at there. Unbelievable. Um, program on Collaborations Together Network is made possible by support from our sponsors, the AV Chicago, the Mark and Jeannie Malnati Family Foundation, the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation, and people just like you, you know, who make one-time donations. Yeah, y'all do that. And some of y'all even sign up to be collaborate uh, activists. And we so, so, so need your support. Uh, I want to just pass the mic to Anthony and let him close it out. Um, I just, once again, want to thank our, our amazing guests um, for your work and your inspiration and your energy and your time tonight. The most precious thing that we have and to be able to spend it together is, is quite special. Uh, this is our, our 28th show. Uh, please join us again. Uh, join us on February 26th and the 27th for Trial in the Delta at the DuSable Museum. And uh, come and join us on, for Becoming on, on March 1st. Um, our active anti-racist workshop where we will be exploring the history of Karen, the complicated relationship with BIPOC women and feminism. And then our Crucial Connection show on March 17th, where we will continue the dialogue with some very special guests. Uh, go to collaboration.org for more information and sign up. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where this, this wonderful episode will, will live and a bunch of other of our Crucial Connection episodes and shows and documentaries and, and um, featurettes. Um, thank you all for, for coming. We do have a, a special uh, video tonight. Stick around to see Marcus Jackson from The Light. And, um, and you know, let's um, stay warm. There's a lot of snow out there in Chicago. Uh, we don't get as much of it anymore. So let's um, enjoy it. And, um, and remember um, Emmett Till and Mamie Till and Laquan McDonald and his family um, as we work to uh, dismantle the injustice of our, of our legal system. And like Marilyn Height Ross said, um, you want change, you gotta show up, you gotta take action. And, and, and that's what we're doing. And we're trying to follow in the, in the footsteps of our amazing uh, guest tonight. So thank you all. <laughs>